The Protestant Reformation of the 16th century shook the very foundation of Europe's cultural identity. The Reformation was a revolution of religion in Western Europe. Essentially, it was the result of centuries worth of political and social grievances against the Christian Church as it existed. Christianity, which began as a fledgling religion in the first century, had grown by the 13th century into an institution powerful enough to rival state governments. For instance, the Pope, then the leader of the Christian Church, had greater political and military influence than some emperors and kings. This tension was exacerbated by the transformative social and intellectual period known as the Renaissance. In particular, this period involved the rise of humanism, a philosophy that shifted man's fate from being determined by religious doctrine to being determined by man himself. Additionally, some within the church believed it had become increasingly corrupt. Priests like John Wycliffe of England and Jan Hus of Bohemia challenged the church's teachings, which they believed had strayed away from the Bible. However, one of the most well-known advocates for a reformed Christian church was a German priest named Martin Luther. Martin Luther began to question the church in the early 1500s. He believed it was abusing its power and disagreed with some of its practices. For instance, he challenged the church's doctrine that stated the Pope, not the Bible, was the ultimate spiritual authority. Plus, he criticized the church for selling indulgences, the practice of purchasing forgiveness for one's sins by giving money to the church. Luther believed the church needed to revise its doctrine by returning to the Bible's teachings and by saying that salvation could be granted by faith in Christ alone. So on October 31st, 1517, Luther took a stand. In what's considered the birth of the Protestant Reformation, Luther is said to have nailed 95 theses, or arguments against the church, onto the door of Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany. Luther was later put on trial in front of church officials to defend his theses, but in January 1521, the church declared Luther a heretic and excommunicated him. While Luther's membership with the church ended, the reformation he argued for started to gain momentum. Unlike Luther's predecessors who challenged the church, Luther had one tool at his disposal that they didn't have. The printing press. This new invention allowed his arguments to be copied and spread across Europe. This unprecedented access to ideas such as Luther's inspired many others to challenge the church, thereby splitting Christianity into two major denominations, Catholic and Protestant, from the word protest. Also, the Bible became more accessible. Luther and other reformists translated biblical text from Latin, which was only known by nobility and church officials, to German, English, and French, languages spoken by the general public. While the Protestant Reformation revolutionized the Christian faith, it had ramifications that extended beyond religion. Prior to the Reformation, many Europeans were dependent on an educated upper class. But perhaps the most resounding impact of the Reformation was that the common people were empowered to question religion and other aspects of life. The Reformation, along with technological innovations and the introduction of other new ideas, gave many in Europe's general public the freedom and power to decide their own fates. Short little video there, of course, from National Geographic, of course, on the background of the Reformation, of course, started by Martin Luther, of course, who we'll talk a lot about today. So, you know, welcoming back Daniel Simon at Baton Rouge Community College. Hope you're having a great first week of classes, uh, of course, in the summer. Uh, of course, today I'm going to have my first lecture, of course, uh, which will be part one on the Reformation. Uh, there'll be a part two, of course, later uh, in the week. So, it's like we've got a bunch of students I know watching live uh, right now. Uh, I know we have Mackenzie who came in earlier this morning. Hey, good morning, Mackenzie. Hope you're having a great time out there. First week of classes. Uh, Daisy, looks like you're uh, good morning. Also, uh, Eloise, good morning. Uh, also, uh, Nadia, 
uh, Al Zara. Hey, good morning. Uh, and also, it looks like Sean's joining us, and also Joy. So, I hope everybody's having a great morning uh, overall uh, for y'all's you know classes at BRCC. So, I'll talk about a few things about you know the first week. You know, the other like yesterday, I believe I, I went over the syllabus. So, if you missed that, you know, syllabus review day. I did. You can go back and, of course, look at the video I've got on uh, my YouTube channel uh, through Canvas or, of course, the links I've sent to you uh, earlier. Uh, also, uh, of course, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about also a few reminders about assignments. I know right now in week one, we've got uh, the pre-test that needs to be uh, completed. I think you've got until I want to say Thursday at midnight, that's tomorrow, uh, to get that wrapped up. Uh, contract policy page, uh, you also need to get that wrapped up as well uh, and turned in. Because I think if you don't do those, you might be considered absent. I don't have any other points somewhere else or whatever for you. Uh, that's something you have to you know, get done uh, more or less in the first you know week. So I think I got to do attendance and all that and see who's in the class and who's really not going to do it uh, and all that. So... Uh, Today, like I said, I'm going to have my first lecture, which we're going to go into the background of the Reformation. I'm going to talk about how Protestantism kind of, kind of emerges uh, in Europe. It's later going to spread to different parts of the world, of course. Uh, also, it does influence the Catholics to have their own like revival, which it's called different names, uh, Catholic Reformation. I think the Protestants call it the Counter-Reformation uh, as well. So I'll mostly talk about that today, both those things. Uh, so if you have any comments, questions during the live stream, you know, let me know and I could try to answer those for you. Uh, or you can always leave me comments, questions on my, my channel. Uh, like about if you have a question about a lecture or whatever, uh, you do get bonus points for commenting, uh, commenting, asking questions, of course, on my YouTube channel. Uh, if you want to subscribe to my channel, you can also do that uh, as well. If you want to join me in StreamYard.com uh, stream right there below, there's the link link to, of course, join me in the broadcast booth uh, as well. So anyway, uh, I'm going to, of course, first talk about today the background of the Reformation, which uh, the Reformation kind of starts almost like in the late Middle Ages. I think some people even think around the 15th century, but it really doesn't really take off until really the early 16th century when you know Martin Luther came along uh, and all that. So, yeah, one of the first things I'm going to talk about is you know, the background of the Re Reformation. Uh, what what was the Reformation? Uh, well, I think I've got a kind of a kind of a um, definition of it. I'll kind of uh, blow up right here. But uh, you can see here it was mostly a religious movement that started in the 1500s. But more or less, it was like a, a religious schism uh, that that occurred uh, in, in the actual Catholic Church where people broke away from it, and you end up getting this Protestant movement that starts afterwards, or the Protestant Reformation, as they often called it. A lot of people just call it the Reformation, uh, for, you know, simply for the short of it. And uh, the movement was heavily started, you can see, by Martin Luther, who was a German priest and monk uh, in what is, uh, they look actually the Holy Roman Empire uh, at the time, and uh, he was the one that really started the whole Reformation, they think. And so you got a period of like maybe around 40 years or so uh, where the Reformation kind of occurs uh, primarily, of course, in Europe. Uh, what were some causes, of course, of the Reformation? That There's plenty of different causes, of course, of why, you know, the Reformation occurred. I'll, of course, get to the 95 Theses, uh, which you see in that image on the right. Uh, right there, but there was a lot of different causes of it. Uh, a lot of it was uh, due to uh, corruption uh, in the Catholic Church, which went back, you know, uh, many years. Uh, I kind of got a list of of different things that were prob mostly a problem within within the actual Catholic Church at the time. I've got a list of them, pretty much. Uh, simony. I don't know if you heard of that. It's kind of like my name, Simon. Uh, but simony was an issue where uh, there was a buying and selling of church offices or clerical offices uh, within the Catholic Church where you could practically put, you know, buy a position uh, in, in the actual Catholic Church. And so that was one, one I guess, example of corruption that they had 
Uh, lay investiture uh, was another issue uh, where uh, like kings or monarchs could actually would, would put clerical officials in power, uh, like a bishop. If you want to be bishop or something like that, uh, they could do that. And the Catholic Church actually cracked down on that and actually had, had certain monarchs excommunicated for trying to appoint certain officials to the church and things like that. Uh, also, clergy living in luxury. That was another issue uh, within the Catholic Church. Some that Martin Luther saw, I believe, when he traveled to Rome, uh, early in his uh, career as a priest. And so he found out that a lot of the clergy are living in luxury, having a lot of privilege and things like that. And so that created a lot of animosity in Europe because uh, they felt like the clergy was not really doing it for their benefit, but maybe to gain wealth. Because even some of the popes uh, became popes to become wealthy and power, powerful. Uh, like the Medici popes, which I think they had four or five of them at one point, like in Italy. Uh, being non-celibate, you had cases where, <clears throat> you know, clergy uh, were, you know, had wives, they had children, you know, things like that. Illiteracy was another issue. They also had the papal schism you may have heard about between the 14th and 15th centuries, uh, where the church basically uh, split into having two popes, one in Italy and one in France. At Avignon, and that was a that was another issue, of course, <clears throat> that they had. So those are, those are all examples of you know different types of um, corrupt issues that they had, you know, uh, within the Catholic Church. Now there were early reformers. I think they were talking about this uh, in that little short video from National Geographic. I'll kind of blow that up there for you, but you can see there uh, Jan Hus, who was in Bohemia now, where the Czech Republic is. Uh, is a fine example of kind of an early priest that tried to make reforms. Uh, Huss was actually a uh, professor and dean at Charles University, uh, which is uh, in um, Prague. Uh, and uh, he was actually burned at the stake uh, for trying to make reforms to the church. I think in, I want to say in 1415, I believe it was. Uh, and then uh, John Wycliffe was also another Got kind of a priest and professor too, University of Oxford in England. Uh, he also tried to to make some reforms too. I want to say back in the 14th century, he was in prison for it and died in prison. So neither one of those men were able to really, you know, do anything with the Reformation. But they think he was the one that really uh, those two kind of got started. Oh, uh, then they talked about Johann Gutenberg. You know, Gutenberg. <clears throat> he's the one that invented the. Uh, movable type printing press uh, in Europe in the 15th century in Germany. Uh, so Gutenberg, you know, had a lot of influence, of course, on, you know, helping to spread, you know, the Reformation uh, because of it made, you know, <clears throat> information about it widely available. Uh, so they could print books and other things like that. Uh, the printing press, they believe, you know, evolved from ideas in China, which I think go back to like the 11th century. Uh, and then by the late Middle Ages, they began to uh, develop the printing press, you know, which obviously spread knowledge uh, after that. Because before that, if you wanted a book, you had to get a scribe who would basically, you know, write it down or copy a book, basically. Now, of course, we're going to get to Martin Luther. Martin Luther, you know, is the most influential uh, figure uh, in the Reformation. Uh, he's pretty much the one that started, they think, the Reformation in Germany uh, in the early 1500s. Uh, Luther uh, was from Saxony, Germany, uh, which is kind of like in the northern part of Germany, and uh, was actually a, a, a monk and professor uh, at the University of Wittenberg. So he's like a professor like me, uh, basically. And uh, he was one of the first to really challenge uh, the Catholic Church openly, uh, and it led to eventually the, the Reformation, of course, beginning uh, pretty much, you know, after after pretty much uh, early, early 1517, I think was the year when it really starts. Now, I'm going to talk about a few things about uh, Luther that really influenced the whole Reformation. Uh, I think you've heard about the indulgence or indulgence issue. That was, of course, another major issue uh, that was considered a corrupt aspect of the Catholic Church. 
And uh, indulgence was where a person could get like their relatives uh, that are in purgatory, uh, get their sins forgiven, like a remission of punishment caused by sin, basically. So if you got an uncle or father or somebody that died and you think they were in purgatory, uh, you could go to the church and they could basically get them out of purgatory to go to heaven. Uh, and apparently Luther did not like this. He thought that was a corrupt practice within the church. Uh, and uh, in fact, at the time, they think that the uh, church was selling a lot of indulgences to uh, construct the new St. Peter's Basilica uh, in Rome, which the old one was kind of falling apart uh, at the time. <clears throat> and so uh, the church was really pushing this uh, basically to you know collect money to, to build this uh, new new uh, basilica <clears throat> and all that. And uh, apparently Luther was influenced by this man named jo Johann Tetzel, who was a Dominican monk, a preacher uh, that was, I guess, in Germany selling a lot of indulgences. And uh, he took it upon himself to basically criticize that uh, as, as a practice that the church really was kind of, you know, overstepping its bounds and all that. And so uh, what happened was Luther decided to write this famous uh, dissertation or thesis, uh, which you may have heard about, uh, which was called the 95 Theses, uh, which, of course, became real famous. Uh, they think it's the main thing that really starts the whole Reformation, which supposedly posted it on the front door of the main church in Wittenberg, Germany, uh, on the date of October 31st, 1570, which, of course, today, I guess, Halloween, I guess, for us uh, today. Uh, and um, the uh, it didn't just criticize indulgences. That's the one thing about, uh, of course, uh, Martin Luther. He went after the church. He said the church really had all these privileges. Uh, he felt like the Pope really wasn't the authority. Uh, it should be like the Bible on uh, things like that. Uh, and so um, <clears throat> he would supposedly post it, if you know about this. Of course, there's a debate about whether he posted it or not, or he just sent somebody uh, to post it on the front door. Uh, there's a famous church. Let's see if I can find the one for you, uh, which is right here. I'll get to the actual Pope, uh, which is right there. But um, so I can find the actual, I had it at the front here. If you go up to right here on the left there, that, of course, uh, is the uh, front door uh, of the Wittenberg Church Castle, which uh, is now called All Saints Church. Well, it's now a Lutheran church, of course. Uh, I suppose he it was posted to that door. It's now called the so-called thesis door, uh, you may have heard of. Uh, and um, anyway, uh, he actually sent a copy of it, believe it or not, to uh, an archbishop. Uh, the Archbishop of Mainz, of course, uh, got a copy of it. And then it was sent all the way to, here's another picture right here, the All Saints Church uh, front door uh, right there. They eventually sent a copy to uh, the Pope, Pope Leo X, uh, who was the Pope, I think, in the Catholic Church from 1513 to about 1521. He was one of those Medici Popes uh, you may have heard about. There's like four or five of them that they had at one point. And uh, if you know what happened, uh, Pope Leo X uh, condemned it. And they thought a lot of the stuff in there was kind of heretical, uh, and actually banned at 1.41 of the actual 95 tracks that were in it and uh, threatened to excommunicate. In fact, threatened him at first and later he would have him excommunicated uh, if you know about this. And um, Pope Leo also sent him this thing called the Papal Bull, uh, if you know about that, which I think it has different names. It's called Exurge Domine, I think is the Latin name they call it. Uh, which means in Latin, arise, O Lord, uh, which was supposedly written on June 15, 1520. Uh, papal bull is like a uh, type of um, letter uh, or document usually sent to someone in the church by the Pope. Uh, the word bull uh, is the word, not, not meaning a bull, but a, a seal. There's a papal seal on it, uh, basically, uh, which I think that's the front cover of it on the left that you're looking at. Uh, and um, you know about it, what happened was Luther took the papal bull, uh, which you see he's got on the right, 
I guess, kind of, you know, crumpled in his hand and he had it burned. It's what he did, which I think he burned it in, I want to say, December of 1520. And they think that's really, I guess, may, maybe when the Reformation really gets started. And uh, if you go to uh, Wittenberg, of Germany today, there's an oak tree that's supposedly on the site where Martin Luther burned it, uh, the papal bull, uh, which they call that tree the so-called Lutherite, which means, I think, Luther oak, what it means. They think that's the site likely where it was, but the tree was put there like a few hundred years, a couple hundred years ago or so. That's when they put it there. So the tree wasn't there uh, when he burned it, uh, but they think that might be the spot. So um, what's going to happen, uh, because the fact that, you know, Luther, you know, starts this firestorm, you know, in the Catholic Church, you're going to have a new religion uh, that emerges uh, because uh, people start using the term uh, Protestant, you know, like they talked about, because uh, a lot of Germans were protesting uh, against the, you know, the Catholic Church because of how they treated, you know, Mark Luther uh, and all that. And so that, that name kind of stuck afterwards. But uh, the new faith was called the Church of Luther or Lutheran Church or Lutheranism. Uh, that's the name that the Catholics called it. Uh, but the Lutherans liked it so much they kept it uh, is what, what happened, of course, uh, with that. So it was a new Protestant religion that was heavily influenced by Martin Luther himself uh, in Germany. Uh, you can see over 60 million people practice it worldwide. I believe it's the third largest Protestant uh, faith uh, in the world. I think the other ones are uh, evangelical, I think is the largest. And then Anglicanism, you know, the Church of England, all that is the second uh, overall. Uh, you can see here, um, that's part of what started. And of course, Luther began to do things like uh, he took the Catholic mass and he made more of a Protestant mass out of it. They even had a later a Protestant catechism. You know, the church, you know, the Catholics have a Catholic catechism. They come up with a Protestant one, a version of that, of course. Uh, Luther put more emphasis on the Bible, uh, you know, justification by faith alone. That becomes a big part of the Protestant faith uh, and all that. More preaching, uh, more music and songs, things like that, uh, of course, are put into uh, the Lutheran religion uh, and all that. Uh, here, by the way, uh, is the theological differences between, you know, Lutheranism on the left uh, versus the Catholic faith, of course, uh, you see on the other side. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can see, so Lutheranism puts more in, on the justification by faith alone. That's one of the big things, faith in Jesus uh, and the Bible are the two main things to salvation, of course, in the Lutheran church. Uh, the sacraments, that's interesting to think about it. Uh, you can see there um, in the Protestant faiths, like the Lutheran one, they only kept two of the seven sacraments, uh, baptism and communion, uh, of course, baptism is called different names later, like a christening or something like that. Uh, the local prince rules over the church and not the pope. Uh, the priest can marry. Like Luther was one of the first priests to marry. I'll talk about that later uh, as well. There's even differences with the communion also as well, or the Eucharist uh, in the church. Uh, you can see the Catholic faith, faith in God and good works save your soul. So not just justification by faith alone, uh, religious truth is in the Bible and also church teachings uh, as well. Uh, Catholic Church, of course, kept all the sacraments uh, as well. All seven of them pretty much kept. Uh, the head of the church is still the Pope uh, in Rome, like Pope Francis, of course, in Rome right now. Uh, priests can't marry. You know, they're supposed to be celibate and all that. Uh, communion is the body and blood of Christ. That's one thing that they actually believe there was a miracle that it converted uh, Lutheran faith, uh, they don't believe that. They think it's kind of there side by side, you know, the bread and the wine with the body and blood of Christ. Uh, they don't think there was a miracle conversion, all that. That's something they talk about sometimes, too. You may have heard about the, you know, the Protestant faith and the, you know, the Catholic one. Uh, the Luther and then the Protestants have what they call consubstantiation. Uh, you can see there. Blood and wine undergoes a spiritual change, which by whereby Christ, Christ is really present, but the bread and wine are not transformed. So it wasn't a miracle. Versus the Catholic Church, transubstantiation, of course, something they believe in, where the bread and wine become the actual body and blood of Christ. Uh, the miracle conversion there 
course, with that. Oh, another thing you may have heard about, which is famous uh, about Protestantism, is you ever heard of the five solas? You may have heard about this before, about that, but uh, something that kind of uh, Martin Luther kind of started, but uh, the five solas, sola scriptura, uh, scripture alone, uh, solus Christus, uh, Christ alone, uh, sola gratia, grace alone, uh, sola fide, faith alone, and then sola dio gloria, uh, glory of God alone uh, as well. So so-called, you know, solas, they sometimes dub. And I think, I want to say that Luther influenced, I know, probably uh, sola scriptura and probably sola fide, uh, those two right there, scripture and faith alone. Uh, now, there is a deal where apparently Luther was given one more chance uh, to recant uh, what he had done, because I think at that point they were excommunicating him uh, from the church. Uh, and so they forced Luther to come to what they call the Diet of Worms. The Diet of Worms was like the main assembly of the Holy Roman Empire, which back then was called Germany, uh, which was a collection of states uh, in, in now what we call Germany. And um, the ruler of Germany at the time was uh, Emperor Charles V. He was also the king of Spain. I think he called Carlos or Charles I uh, in Spain. And uh, April 18, 1521, he met before the Diet of Worms, uh, of course, where they basically almost basically declared him a heretic at that point. Basically, he was forced to recant uh, what, uh, you know, uh, his beliefs about the 95 Theses and his ideas uh, against the church, uh, but he refused. If you know about it, he refused to recant uh, at that point. And so Charles the si Charles, Charles V uh, issued what they call the Edict of Verbs, where he was declared an outlaw. And so a lot of his writings, 95 Theses and other things he wrote, uh, were actually banned uh, throughout Germany. It looked like he was going to possibly be burned the stake, uh, which you know happened before, right? Jan Hus. I think was burnt at the stake too on things like that. But apparently uh, there was this man named Frederick III, who was the ruler of Saxony in Germany. He called him Frederick the Wise or the Elector of Saxony. He actually gave Luther refuge uh, in his castle. You know about this. And um, the castle, I, I think I've got a picture of it right here. It's called Wartburg Castle, uh, which is in Eisenach in Germany. It's kind of like in central Germany, like northern Germany. Here he is, Frederick III of Saxony on the left. And uh, at that point, uh, what happened was Luther began to uh, even begin to translate the Bible. Like, I think the New Testament he began translating into German and things like that uh, as well. And so that was instrumental in really, you know, keeping the Protestant movement alive. And so there's a lot of Germans like Frederick III. They're really the first Protestants that are kind of protesting, you know, uh, against the church. And all that. Uh, Luther also was one of the first, you know, priests in the Catholic Church to break away and marry and go away from that celibacy thing, if you know about that. And he actually married this woman named Katharina von Bora, you see on the right there. That became basically his wife. And uh, Katharina was a, uh, she was an ex nun, apparently. And there was a kind of a funny story about this, but Apparently, a few years before that, uh, Luther had helped about 12 nuns escape from a convent because a lot of these Protestants were trying to close down the convents and monasteries, uh, like in Germany. And he helped actually about 11 of those 12 nuns find husbands, like to marry somebody uh, and all that. And apparently, he couldn't find a wife. Uh, excuse me, couldn't find uh, like a husband for, for Katharina to marry uh, and all that. And so she just suggested that you ought to marry me, <laughs> basically. Uh, so, yeah, he ends up marrying her. Uh, and I think they had six children together. Uh, kind of an interesting story uh, about that. So so that's 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 the story, you know, of Martin Luther and, you know, uh, how he started the, the Lutheran movement, you know, throughout Germany. And Lutheranism will spread, like in the Scandinavia. Uh, it spreads to different parts of the world, like in Africa, uh, North America, you know, and so on. So it does spread worldwide at, at one point. <clears throat> now, I want to move on next. I want to talk about also the movement called Calvinism, which you may have heard about uh, as well, which uh, kind of blow this up here, but you can see how John Calvin 
uh, was one of the figures that really started uh, to spread Protestantism more. Uh, you have basically uh, Calvinism, which was a type of um, new um, variation of Protestantism that became popular like in France and other Switzerland, other countries in, in Europe, later in Britain, et cetera, Scotland. Uh, and um, Calvin was actually French. Uh, I know it looks like an English name there, uh, John Calvin, but his actual French name was Jean uh, Coven or something like or Chauvin, because they say actually the French name or variation of it. I think in Louisiana, we say Chauvin or something like that. That's how we say it. Uh, but um, <clears throat> he, started, he was originally Catholic. Uh, I think he attended the University of Paris, uh, was actually a lawyer uh, by trade. Uh, and eventually, because of the influence of Martin Luther, he converted to being a Protestant and later would become a pastor, of course, also like a preacher uh, as well. And so he's the so-called principal founder of Calvinism, which is actually a name that the Lutherans called because the, I think the Lutherans didn't like the Calvinist movement, if you know about that. So that's a nickname that actually kind of was spawned later, but uh, they preferred to call it Reformed Christianity, I think was one, or Reformed Churches, I think was the common name uh, they called it. And so you get different types of names like congre con Congregational, uh, of course, is Christianity is one, Reformed Christianity, uh, Presbyterianism, Reformed Baptism, uh, things like that are different groups uh, that eventually break away and form their own Protestant variation of it. Uh, Calvin was heavily influential because of a book uh, that he wrote, uh, which is called The Institutes of the Christian Religion, which he wrote, by the way, in his 20s, like late 20s when he wrote, wrote it in uh, 1536, which I think was written originally in Latin. Uh, and then it began to be translated to different languages like French and other languages uh, throughout the world. And um, the Institutes is what I usually call it for short. Uh, is considered one of the most influential books in Protestantism outside the Bible, uh, as you know. It's kind of considered like almost like an introductory textbook book of how the Protestant faith works uh, and all that. It talks about its doctrines, uh, the sacraments of the Protestant church, uh, justification by faith alone, uh, even goes into things like Christian liberty, uh, etc. Uh, so, and heavily attacked the Catholic Church also, you know, as you know. Uh, and um, you can see there they had different ideas, uh, like they viewed men and women as sinful by nature. Uh, also, they, they believed heavily uh, in what they call pre predestination, or some people called it also uh, predeterminism is another thing they believed in. They actually believed that God knew from the beginning who was going to be saved. Uh, and who was not, uh, who damned, you know, damned to hell, uh, things like that. And so they believe in uh, like the so-called uh, elect or election, uh, where God has saved certain people uh, to go to heaven. But you know, the Protestants reject this idea of, of you know, purgatory. You either, either go to heaven or you go to hell, uh, things like that. Uh, and so that's something they heavily believe in. Also, uh, besides, uh, you know, besides that belief, you know, predestination, being a main thing, it's a big part of Calvinism. They also have, believe heavily, like in a church governance as well, uh, like a theocracy, religious theocracy uh, as well, uh, which is part of the church. So they have church leaders. They don't have like priests and things like that uh, that they have. Uh, I think only like maybe the Anglican Church has things like that, maybe where they have episcopacy or bishops and things like that. Uh, but they don't really believe. They believe more like in church elders and things like that. Uh, Calvin, as you know, ended up fleeing from France. France goes through a period called the French Wars of Religion. So he would go to Geneva uh, in Switzerland, and they think that's where Calvinism really took off uh, at first. Uh, and so he based a lot of that on a lot of their ideas, uh, theocracy, predestination, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, their Calvinistic beliefs were very strict. So you had to dress a certain way, uh, go to church all the time, study the Bible. Uh, you couldn't do things like games and sports and things like that. Uh, you can see there uh, any violation of, you know, rules or whatever. Uh, could, you could end up being excommunicated, uh, thrown in prison. There's even cases where they burned people at the stake. Uh, they were considered heretical and things like that. 
Uh, that spawned the Puritans later, you know, and all that Calvinism, uh, like in England and also in uh, North America, like in the United, where, where the really the American colonies would be later, North America. Uh, you also got John Knox, who you see uh, on the left. He was a very important figure. Uh, Knox was the main leader that started the Scot Scottish Reformation. Uh, if you know about it, uh, uh, John Knox went to Switzerland at one point and met John Calvin. And so he was so influential uh, that he decided to go back to Scotland and create his own Reformation, of course, there. And that became known as the Church of Scotland, which uh, in, in Scotland they call it the Kirk uh, for short, which uh, means in uh, Scottish, uh, the church. And uh, they began to try to get rid of Catholicism uh, in Scotland. And they later call it Presbyterianism. They call it that because of the fact that the uh, people that run the church are called uh, presbyters or church elders, which I think they have like, I want to say about 40 of them that are in it, uh, that kind of run it. And um, today the Church of Scotland probably has about 1.4 million people that are followers of it uh, overall. But for a long time, it eventually becomes the main church uh, in Scotland. They even run out Catholic rulers like Mary, Queen of Scots, get rid of her and all that because uh, they want, you know, Protestant rulers to <clears throat> rule over, <clears throat> uh, you know, Scotland. Uh, but they rejected the whole, uh, I think the Anglicans wanted them to have like bishops and priests and things like that. They rejected that idea. Uh, Knox was also influential helping to write the Book of Common Prayer, by the way, which later became the main prayer book uh, of the Anglican Church. So he kind of influenced that church as well. Uh, but he had his own, of course, he helped start, of course, in Scotland. <clears throat> now, you've also got Ulrich Swing Lee. He's another figure uh, that was also big <clears throat> in the Reformation as well. Swing Lee was a uh, Swiss reformer uh, who started what they call the Swiss, Swiss Protestant Reformation there. Uh, as well. And um, he kind of was like Luther. Uh, he broke from the Catholic Church. He was originally like a priest or monk uh, that was part of that uh, as well. <clears throat> and um, he began to preach in Zurich. That's where basically he, his movement was called, which I think they call themselves the Zwingliens, those that followed uh, Ulrich Zwingli. Wasn't around long because he died in 1531, but uh, he helped influence a lot of changes within the church. Like Zwingli was one of the first to decide to you know, get rid of monasteries, <clears throat> convents, and things like that. He was also one of the first to marry, uh, just like Martin Luther was uh, as well. Uh, the only thing, though, uh, him and Luther disagreed on some issues. Uh, I don't know if you have heard about this, but uh, Luther and Zwingli actually met which is true about this, <clears throat> they met in October of 1529 uh, in what is Marburg, I think in Germany, and uh, it became known as the Marburg Colloquy, <clears throat> where uh, they disagreed about the whole uh, <clears throat> Eucharist, uh, the Lord's Supper. And um, I think the difference was, was I told you that Luther believed that in consubstantiation about the fact that, you know, the the bread and bl blood of Christ, uh, it didn't actually, it didn't, you know, miraculously convert, but it was there side by side. Well, Zwing Lee didn't agree with that. He thought it was more symbolic. Uh, and, and so that was one thing that kind of helped to split, you know, Protestantism more, you know, about that. Uh, and it'll keep splitting. You know, after that. So that was one thing that was kind of a difference uh, between, they had similarities in what they wanted to do with the movement, but uh, that was one thing that kind of, they couldn't agree on uh, the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist. <clears throat> now, uh, they have also other Protestants that were out there, you may have heard about, uh, such as they had the so-called Radical Reformation. Uh, these were Protestants that didn't agree really with the Catholic movement or also the uh, Lutheran or the Calvins. Uh, so they kind of broke away uh, themselves. Uh, a lot of them, like the Anabaptists, if you know about that, uh, were the main group that really started the Radical Reformation. 
which I think took off mostly in Germany, Switzerland, uh, the Dutch Republic, in those areas. And um, they had different beliefs. Like they believed that they ought to abolish private property. Uh, in fact, I think they say the Anabaptists were almost kind of like communists somewhat. You know about that? Uh, they also had new ideas of baptism. One thing that they you know, heavily believed in, uh, if you know about this, was the practice of adult baptism. Like they thought that Christians uh, should not get baptized until they're adult, what they call believers' baptism. And uh, they believe they, the reason for that uh, is because the fact that they thought that people shouldn't, you know, convert until they knew what they're doing, you know, believing in Christ and things like that. You don't know, you don't know what you're doing when you're an infant, right? When you're being baptized. <clears throat> and so that was the, the reason for that. Uh, separation of church and state, yeah, it's something they kind of did favor uh, as well. And then you can see the different groups, uh, Amish, Mennonites, uh, those were the main groups uh, you see later uh, that kind of influence, influenced by this movement. Uh, modern Baptists were influenced by them too, and also the Quakers as well, like mostly in the United States. Uh, those are some movements that really <clears throat> they're involved in. I think I've got a map showing you about where they were, but most of them came out of Germany, Switzerland, and then you can see the Netherlands where the Dutch Republic is later. Uh, now, also, I'm going to get to uh, as well, I want to talk about also the, uh, <clears throat> what is the uh, English, I'll talk about the English Reformation as well, just for a few minutes on that, and then I'll also wrap up talking about the Catholic Reformation that they had uh, as well. Uh, they had the English Reformation, which was started, by the way, by uh, Tudor England, uh, under the Tudor dynasty uh, in the early 1500s. I'll kind of blow this up here. You can see, uh, of course, the famous king that you're looking at right there. King Henry VIII, as you know, uh, was the founder of the Church of England, also known as the Anglican Church, or Anglicanism, uh, as they called it. And uh, King Henry, of course, is considered one of the greatest monarchs in British history, uh, at least male, male monarchs. I think the greatest monarch is probably Queen Elizabeth I, uh, but uh, he had a heavy influence on uh, breaking away from the Catholic Church, which a lot of it was not really because of... Um, uh, religious reasons. It was really because of dynastic reasons. Uh, if you know about Henry VIII, he's famous for his six wives, the six wives of Henry VIII. And um, the one at the top left you're looking at, which is Catherine of Aragon, who was a Spanish princess, uh, the daughter of, of um, <clears throat> Ferdinand Isabella of, of Castile and Aragon. And um, apparently she had, he had only given him like one daughter that had survived. Uh, he wanted to, you know, remarry because he wanted a male heir. And so it was really dynastic issues of why he decided to form, you know, the Anglican Church. And so that, that was the reason for why the Church of England uh, was founded afterwards. And so, yeah, the Church of England found, they think in the 1530s, it's about when it gets started, although the church kind of evolves over time, up through like the time of Henry VIII uh, to Queen Elizabeth I. I think even uh, Queen Mary the First, Bloody Mary, even tried to have it shut down uh, at one point. But Anglicanism would eventually spread worldwide because you know, of the British Empire and all that. And so 110 million people uh, actually practice some form of Anglicanism. Almost half are in Africa, by the way, because uh, of the British influence in Africa and all that. So that is something that you know he's very famous for later, of course. Uh, with that, which I won't talk about that right now. I'll kind of come back later and, of course, talk about that when I get to the like the stage of the early British Empire and all that. I'll get more into how it evolved. But I did want to talk about one more thing today, of course, which is the uh, the so-called Catholic Reformation that they have, which uh, the Catholic Reformation has different names. Uh, some people call it that, but uh, some people refer to it as the so-called Catholic revival or the counter-reformation because it was seen as this counter to the Protestant movement uh, that was going on 
well, at the time. Uh, you can see at the top left there, that picture right there, that is Pope Paul III, uh, who was the head of the Catholic Church at the time when this happened. And they think it was him that started the whole uh, Catholic Reformation, which would last for, you can see, almost 20 years, 1545, 1563. And uh, the Council of Trent, which was which was an ecumenical council that met in northern Italy, uh, they basically met there to reaffirm uh, the traditional views of the Catholic faith, uh, like what they would be uh, in all that. And so um, I think there's something like three different popes at one point that were part of the whole, you know, um, I'm trying to think of other popes that were, Part of it that were there, but they had uh, Pope Julius the Third, I think, was another one, and also Pius the Fourth. That was the other popes uh, that were involved. They met 255 sessions at one point uh, at Trent or Trento, uh, Italy. They actually condemned Protestantism as a heresy, basically, uh, is what it is. And uh, these are examples of reforms that they decided on uh, that became part of the church traditionally, which is still is today. Uh, they kept all the sacraments. So all seven of the sacraments were kept, of course, they were part of the church. Uh, the veneration of the saints, that's you know a big part of the Catholic church and still like the Virgin Mary, probably the biggest one that's part of that. Uh, they kept that in the veneration of her. Uh, the Vulgate Bible, uh, which is the Latin-based Bible, which goes back to uh, Jerome, St. Jerome, which I believe he helped develop that in the fourth century, of course, or a Tridentine Bible, they call it too, I think, as well. Uh, also, the Latin Mass, of course, the Latin, yeah, the Latin Bible or Latin Mass, pretty much those things are kept pretty much uh, in, in the church, which they kept the Latin Mass until 1969, uh, that it was that way. Uh, Roman Catechism was created to te teach you know, Catholics, the religious faith and the prayers, things like that as well. Because the Protestants had theirs, right? Protestant catechism. So they had the Roman one that they had. They formed seminaries uh, also as well. Uh, they actually banned indulgences, uh, which is something they did, I think, in 1567, a little later. Uh, but I guess the damage had been done. Of course, some people think it never really happened. It never was an official part of the church. Look at all that. Uh, the Roman Inquisition was something that they also backed to uh, where they could put people on trial uh, for heresy uh, as well. Uh, believe it or not, they did also ban heretical works. They had actually had a list of prohibited books uh, that you couldn't read uh, if you were Catholic, uh, which some of these works I think were banned at one point up to 1966. It actually has a Latin name. It's called the Index Librorum prohibitorum. Uh, and uh, these are all kinds of books uh, or authors that you could not read. Galileo, Dennis Diderot, Voltaire, Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, Copernicus, you've heard of him, uh, Sir Francis Bacon, Immanuel Kant, uh, Rene Descartes, John Locke. Uh, a lot of their works were banned uh, by the church uh, and all that. One that I always thought was surprisingly uh, that wasn't banned I don't think they banned Karl Marx, as far as I know. Uh, and um, I think, I guess the, the one that everybody thinks of is Charles Darwin, right? They didn't ban Darwin, believe it or not. So I don't know. It's kind of weird about that one. Uh, but um, so then they had also, uh, they had these different uh, movements that started like the Jesuits uh, that came out. The Jesuits were these Catholic order of priests uh, that were formed in the 1540s. We've heard of them, uh, which uh, Jesuits uh, stood for, uh, meaning the Society of Jesus, uh, which the current Pope, you know, Pope Francis is a Jesuit. I think the only one that's ever been elected as, as Pope uh, in all that. I think some people call them the soldiers of Christ sometimes. And uh, they, were, they were very instrumental in trying to, you know, protect the Catholic faith and prevent Protestants from spreading. Uh, they went all over the world trying to convert people or reconvert people, uh, things like that, set up seminaries, churches, and schools, uh, and all that in the name of Christianity, uh, et cetera. And it had a founder you may have heard of named uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola. 
Uh, he's a, actually an ex-Spanish soldier that uh, became a Catholic priest, and he helped form the order uh, in the 1540s. Uh, and um, you can see there on the right, uh, St. Ignatius, of course, of Leola was famous for a book he wrote uh, called The Spiritual Exercises, uh, which was a type of uh, book of meditation and prayers that they would use for like Catholic retreats and things like that. Uh, so that's a big part of the Jesuits still today uh, overall. And he was one of their first leaders. He was, I think the title they go by is uh, Superior General, uh, is the leader uh, of the Jesuits, and they're right under the Pope. Uh, there are actually some other co-founders. Co I don't know if you know about this, but St. Francis Xavier, uh, you may have heard of him. He's a very famous Catholic priest uh, as well that pretty much knew, uh, of course, also uh, Ignatius of Loyola. Uh, and he was an instrumental, too, in helping to spread the Catholic faith. In fact, I think he was one of the men that instr instrumental in helping it spread to, like, Asia, if you know about that uh, as well. Uh, both pretty much... Uh, St. Francis Xavier and Loyola have a lot of schools and universities, of course, named after him. Now in New Orleans, they've got a bunch of schools named after him, of course, as you know. St. Peter Faber on the right uh, was another uh, famous priest that was helped found also the, uh, the Jesuits as well. Now, they were sometimes called the Soldiers of Christ. That's kind of a nickname uh, they were kind of given. They're kind of like, almost like militant priests, I guess, somewhat. Uh, but a lot of times they got killed sometimes, uh, like in like in the Americas, Africa, uh, et cetera, trying to convert people, uh, things like that. Oh, they have also this thing you may have heard of called the Order of, uh, of St. Ursuline. You know, you've heard of that. Uh, uh, St. Ursula was this um, nun, I guess, or I guess, I guess a Christian woman that went back to like Roman times and all that. She's a Roman Christian, uh, and uh, she... This particular movement started in the 1570s. It's a basically basically a Catholic religious order of women uh, that were consecrated, uh, starting like around 1572. And so uh, the Ursulines are nuns that helped to, you know, found like schools for mostly women. Uh, they run convents uh, and things like that uh, overall. So they they were kind of a, something that kind of spawned out of the whole Reformation. Uh, at that point. Uh, actually, in New Orleans, there's a school there called the Ursuline Academy. You may have heard about it, which was founded in 1727. It's considered one of the oldest Catholic schools uh, in, in the United States. In fact, I think it's the oldest school uh, for young women in the United States, and it was founded by the Ursulines uh, and all that. So, so that's, that's basically, you know, some of the early stages of the Reformation. You got the, you know, they got the Protestant Reformation, uh, and then you got the Catholic one that's kind of going on uh, as well. I'm going to talk about it later in the week tomorrow, but I'll talk about how things kind of get bloody uh, because of the, the Reformation. You got, you know, Catholics versus Protestants, and uh, they start killing each other uh, because of this. Uh, and so I'll, I'll talk mostly about the Thirty Years War. The Thirty Years War was like the peak of the Reformation, which uh, ended in 1648. Uh, so I'll kind of discuss that, of course, later. Uh, we did have a few students that came in late. I'm sorry I missed you, but Veronica, uh, they came in late. It also looks like Shanda also came in uh, as well. Uh, so uh, before I go, I did want to remind you, of course, about a few things. Don't forget, of course, uh, you got these two current assignments that are out that are due this week, I think due tomorrow night, Thursday night, uh, the pre-test uh, and the contract policy page. So don't forget about, of course, turning that in uh, or, you know, emailing it to me or whatever, because uh, that's going to count towards attendance toward, toward week one. So if you don't do that, it's almost like you're absent. Unless I see some points elsewhere that you've been participating, whatever. Uh, but uh, I'll have that part two lecture tomorrow, of course, on the Reformation, which there will be a Canvas quiz coming up on that, uh, which will be due, of course, uh, next week. Uh, and uh, But I'll send out probably an email today sometime about the lecture tomorrow, of course, that part two lecture. I think later in the week I'll have a recorded lecture I will have as well. So that's it for today. I uh, hope, Like I said, I hope you're having a great first week of summer classes at BRCC. But I'll see you, of course, later in the week. So y'all take care. Have a great one.